Welcome, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Great, thanks Brian for inviting me to do this talk because it's very timely since the announcement just came on Friday. And then there have been further developments this week and some publications yesterday. So let's just launch into it. So we're talking about third doses and boosters of COVID vaccine. I thought I'd do a question. I can't see everyone on the on my screen, but maybe Brian can tell me what people say. So a 60-year-old man with well-controlled HIV, a CD4 count of 570, with underlying COPD presents to routine care and asks about getting a booster dose of a COVID-19 vaccine today. He received two doses of the Pfizer mRNA vaccine three weeks apart as appropriate back in April of 2021. Would you offer him another dose of vaccine today? I can just do like a basic hands up, but I can't see your hands. So why don't we do a show of hands? This is Brian. We'll do a show of hands and I will keep an eye out. How about Yes, you would offer him a dose of vaccine today. One, two, three, three bold hands. How about no, would not offer him a vaccine today on this date. More hands for no. Okay, great, great. All right, so let me just distinguish between what an additional dose is versus a booster dose. Because today, what is authorized under FDA is additional doses for certain populations, which I'll get into. So an additional dose is after a primary series administration to offer an additional dose of vaccine to essentially allow for an immune response because the primary vaccine series was insufficient. A booster dose is when essentially immunity has waned over time. And what we're doing is giving an additional dose of vaccine to boost your immune response. So right now, what the CDC has endorsed and what the FDA has included under the emergency use authorization of the mRNA vaccines is an additional dose of vaccine for those who have insufficient immunity after primary series. So what are the data to support this? I will tell you there are limited data to support it. And really the big group that had been looked at, there were two studies, one earlier this year that suggested that one dose wasn't sufficient and two dose was okay in solid organ transplant patients. And this more recent publication in the New England Journal that looked at about a hundred solid organ transplant patients, mostly kidney transplant that looked at immune response responses against spike protein antibodies before the first dose, before the second dose, and before the third dose, as well as one month after the third dose. And you can see that these patients are really not like the general population where we see pretty robust immune responses to the mRNA vaccine, where they really have a diminished response. But you can see the third dose led to remarkably significant titers compared to the first and second dose. So based on this and concerns about immunocompromised patients shedding virus for longer and potentially leading to more viral mutations, there was a lot of emphasis on getting additional dose to these patients. And we don't, uh, much of what the recommendations are are extrapolated from this study. One other thing that I want to say is we don't have a good correlate of immunity for people who receive the vaccine. Anti-spike protein antibodies are not the only marker, I would say, of protection. So we know that there are T-cell responses that are really important for developing immune response to the vaccine, and those aren't measured by those anti-spike protein antibodies. So that is one caveat. So when the CDC and uh, met last week on Friday, so less than a week ago, they discussed who would be eligible. And we're really looking at patients who are moderately to severely immunosuppressed. So they wanted to take that solid organ study and sort of say for solid organ transplant level suppression, essentially. So we're looking at people who are undergoing active chemotherapy or treatment for malignancies 
people who have received a solid organ transplant and are taking immunosuppressive therapy, and then CAR T cell therapy or stem cell therapy, these patients are pretty heavily immunosuppressed. People with primary immunodeficiency disorders that are moderate to severe. And I wanted to emphasize primary. There are a lot of people who are like, well, I get frequent colds. That's not what we're talking about here. These are people with diagnosed in primary immunodeficiency. Of relevance to our group is this advanced or untreated HIV. So when we're talking about moderate to severe immunosuppression, we're talking about people with T cell counts less than 200 or untreated HIV. So this is not the majority of our folks that we take care of. So they would not be in this immediate group for additional doses. And then those who are taking higher doses of corticosteroids and a number of other immunosuppressive therapies some of our patients who with HIV may also be on, have other comorbidities that may put them in this group aside from their HIV. So that's something else to consider. So for instance, if they're on a TNF blocker for whatever reason, or they're taking steroids for high dose steroids for something else, or they have a malignancy, then they would fit into this group. So the recommendations as put forth by the advisory committee for immunization practices last week were to give an additional dose at least 28 days after that second dose of mRNA vaccine. And the third dose should be the same type as received previously, but if not available, then okay to give either product. And in this situation, we're only talking about Pfizer and Moderna. And I want to make that clear as the mRNA vaccine. Another real clear point to stress is do not check antibody titers to assess a immune response to determine eligibility for this third dose. So many patients are asking, well, I got, you know, someone checked, I wanted to check my antibodies and they aren't there and I got the vaccine. So can I get the additional dose? No. Again, we do not see that as necessarily a good correlate of immunity. So I would say, no, please wait until you are eligible. And we do not check titers. We've been really trying to de-emphasize checking titers in this population because we don't really know what they mean. If possible, in terms of immunosuppression, like if someone were to get rituximab or they're getting Embryl or some other kind of biologic, if you can give it at least two weeks prior to that initiation of immunosuppression, that is preferred. As you saw from those percentages, you can see here that even after the third dose, we're still talking less than 70% protection on average in terms of antibody responses for these solid organ transplant patients. So I want to emphasize the third dose is not necessarily a magic dose that's going to make you immune. These patients are moderately to heavily immunosuppressed. And I still would say continue masking, continue practicing physical distancing, because the vaccine may still not work in someone who is still undergoing active chemotherapy or still on high level immunosuppression. The other thing that I want to make sure that people do, which I didn't put on this slide is encouraging their family members, household members, friends to all get vaccinated because that person who's immunosuppressed with the CD4 count of 10 may not mount an immune response, but if they have a cocoon of protection around them with everybody else around them vaccinated, then that's going to help them as well. So really talking to your patients about who's in the household, are they vaccinated? Make sure that they get vaccinated. Okay. So I want to switch gears to booster dose, even though Brian didn't ask me to talk about that. I know that it's a question that is coming up because there's a lot in the news right now and patients want to be ready to get it when it's available to them. So as I mentioned before, booster doses are for people whose immune response to COVID-19 vaccine has waned over time and to offer additional protection. So the rationale, actually there were two MMWR early releases yesterday that came out to support use of boosters. One is, and I wanted to emphasize, don't everyone run out and get it right now. <laughs> the FDA EUA vaccines that are authorized are, were safe and very effective at get, preventing hospitalizations and death for the majority of people. We know that that level of protection was really high, but we are seeing more transmission 
from vaccinated to person to vaccinated person. Even though the majority of our hospitalizations and deaths that we're seeing from COVID are really in unvaccinated folks, we still have a lot of ongoing transmission in people who have been vaccinated. And so to end this pandemic, that's why we're having this discussion about booster dosing. So new data from the CDC that was published looked at numbers of hospitalizations in New York based on vaccination status for two periods of time. One earlier on in the year in May to July when people had recently been vaccinated and there wasn't a lot of Delta, wasn't any Delta, to later on in the summer when we were seeing predominantly Delta. And what I wanna highlight, because they don't have a lot of fancy colors in this, so I'm just gonna go over this a little bit. The bottom line there, the solid line is rates per 100,000, cases per 100,000 of COVID hospitalizations in New York among those who are fully vaccinated. So it's pretty flat in the early part of the summer or late spring, early summer. And then we started to see that rise with our current surge with the predominant Delta variant. The next line there that's dotted is cases in all persons, vaccinated and unvaccinated. And you can see above that, with the bigger dotted line is cases for unvaccinated. And you can see this just huge spike that's really driving most of the hospitalizations is unvaccinated folks. And then above that is essentially cases in the fully vaccinated coverage. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a section in a second. And then what the highlight of this study is, is actually what is the vaccine efficacy so starting off, this is the, the number that we're using here, the percentage starting off pretty high, just over 91%. And then you can see over time, it's 79% or so for estimated vaccine efficacy or effectiveness, because that's real world effectiveness in these patients. So really important data to show that we are seeing waning responses over time to our vaccine. Although in terms of hospitalizations, the majority of people getting admitted are unvaccinated folks. Does that make sense? Okay. Another study that was just published yesterday and sorry, the first point was just more data from CDC and it shouldn't have been an extra thing, but so this is specifically in our nursing home residents. So as you remember, nursing home residents were in the 1A category. So early on when, in the vaccine efforts, we were targeting frontline healthcare workers, but also nursing home residents, as we were seeing in our area, was one of the first areas actually of seeing that nursing home outbreak and a lot of death and morbidity and mortality associated with it. So in these elderly vulnerable patients, we saw original efficacy in terms of laboratory to diagnose COVID. This is not hospitalizations, but diagnosed COVID is 74.7%. So that was in March to May of 2021. And now we're seeing in late June to July decline to 53%. Again, these are our most vulnerable patients who can die from COVID and who can also person to person spread in facilities and shut down facilities. And so I really wanted to highlight look at the whopping number of cases that we're seeing. So pre-Delta, this is that March to mid-May period, 466 cases. And you can see here in the Delta, although proportionally you can see that there's more weekly count of residents, but you can see that, that our numbers are really high amongst nursing home residents once again. And so this intermediate period was where we sort of have that lull in cases before Delta took off. So again, more data to suggest that there is a waning response in terms of laboratory confirmed cases, as well as hospitalizations amongst vaccinated folks. And we know that there's been more reports about transmission from vaccinated to vaccinated individuals. They may not get sick, but what we're seeing is just ongoing transmission and increasing case counts. So recommendations, there are no recommendations yet, likely be issued on February 20th after FDA and CDC meet 
again to work out the details. It will likely be eight months after the initial series has been completed. So again, when we go back eight months, who is going to be eligible first? It's going to be our healthcare workers, and it's going to be people People who are um, long-term care facility residents. And so, and then we'll kind of march forward from that. For anyone who is really anxious and wanting to get this booster now, I really caution you to wait. We want our most vulnerable people in our community to have access first and wait until the official recommendations come out for the general population. Other considerations, there are, what, what if you got a J&J? There are no recommendations currently for additional doses after you receive J and J. CDC, FDA are reviewing this. Currently, in our area, we have no J and J. The supply is really limited. They are working on boosting that supply right now. There are also other studies going on through mix and match studies that are looking at mRNA vaccine post J and J, and will hopefully have some preliminary data that will guide the use of mRNA vaccines post J and J, but, but no data just yet. So it's still a little up in the air, but this is an area that I know that people who got J and J are really anxious about it. And so I'm telling them to hold off, continue masking, physical distancing, and we'll hopefully have some recommendations soon. Future considerations, will we need ongoing boosters? That is a big question mark. I have no idea. As you all know, this entire pandemic, we are learning as we go. Initially, I mean, it was all over the place about whether we'd need boosters before. It was, well, maybe, maybe there's lifelong protection. Maybe not. Maybe we need to cover variants. Maybe we need to alter the vaccine. This is all an area of, of active research and surveillance. And so we are all learning together about this. And so it may be that we need kind of our annual COVID vaccine, just like the flu vaccine, but more to come in the future as we learn more. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.